Okay, thank you everybody for joining me in this talk and I appreciate your attention. Today we'll be talking about the ketogenic diet, the science of the ketogenic diet and the clinical applications. I am an associate professor at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. And I'm also a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, where we do uh, human research and operational uh, type research. Before I begin, I want to disclose our research support. We have uh, funding through federal organizations, including the Department of Defense and the NIH. We also partner with different uh, industry uh, partners in sponsored contracts for research. Mm -hmm. And we work with a variety of foundations. And I'm an, an advisor for Levels Health, Readout Health, uh, Leo Wellness, and Zero App, and consult for United Healthcare. And I am an owner of Ketone Technologies LLC and maintain the educational website ketonutrition.org. And before I begin, I want to mention that this presentation is not medical advice or nutrition advice. So today we'll be covering the clinical ketogenic diet. Many people do not know that the ketogenic diet originated uh, in medicine 100 years ago, uh, actually in 1921. And the application was for treating epilepsy. And today it's drug resistant epilepsy, but prior to uh, the 1960s, there was really no efficacious anti-seizure drugs. So the ketogenic diet was the standard of care for seizure disorders. And I'll be talking about ketogenic physiology in the context of fasting, but also how different types of ketogenic diets can produce, uh, change our physiology <clears throat> to produce hyperketonemia. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about uh, the methods that you can employ to produce a state of therapeutic ketosis and the different mechanisms by which the ketogenic diet produces its health benefits and performance benefits uh, under certain environments. And there's an emerging uh, science in the clinical applications of the ketogenic diet. Uh, just maybe 15 years ago, the only clinical application for a ketogenic diet was for pediatric epilepsy. And that has expanded tremendously, which is part of my presentation here. We'll be talking about the proven applications for a ketogenic diet and the emerging applications that are uh, peer-reviewed publications in animal models and in humans, and also uh, we'll do a, a review of clinicaltrials.gov, which is a government website where clinical trials are posted on the ketogenic diet, and talk a little bit about type 1 diabetes and the use of a ketogenic diet for type 1 diabetes, which is a bit controversial, but it ties into the application of a ketogenic diet for glycemic management but also in the context of exercise, which is a topic I just discussed at the American Diabetes Association. And I'll finish with some references and resources. So the clinical ketogenic diet really did not gain, uh, really did not have any attention until Jim Abrams of the Charlie Foundation uh, got on Dateline NBC and discussed in a Medical Secrets episode in 1994 the use of a ketogenic diet to cure his son, Charlie, of epilepsy, which was drug-resistant pediatric epilepsy. So if you look at the chart here, and I took this off the ketogenic, um, or off the Charlie Foundation website, uh, which was on Johns Hopkins website, you could see in 1994, there was an explosion of ketogenic diet research. And this chart just goes to 2017, but I extended it to 2020. And as you can see, there's an exponential increase in the number of peer reviewed publications uh, on the ketogenic diet. And I would say about a third of them to 40% to are for seizures. But what has really expanded is the, the emerging applications of the ketogenic diet. And in 1997, Jim Abrams' uh, friend, uh, Meryl Streep did a movie about the ketogenic diet, and it was sort of a docudrama about his uh, experience using the ketogenic diet and his son, Charlie. And the name of that movie is called First Do No Harm. 
and it also brought considerable attention to the ketogenic diet and really helped drive a lot of the research. So the ketogenic diet is used clinically for seizures. It is not a fad diet. It, uh, it has been used for weight loss, you know, the Atkins diet we're all familiar with, but I think it's important to acknowledge that a ketogenic diet is a rather restrictive diet, very carbohydrate restricted diet, very high fat diet, not necessarily a high protein diet, although there are versions of the ketogenic diet we'll talk about. So what's very interesting to me and is why I got into this research is that um, I, I, I did see the, the Dateline NBC uh, story when I was studying nutrition back in college and still probably thought it was a little bit snake oil <laughs> until I started uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, I was researching seizures and uh, CNS oxygen toxicity seizures, which are a limitation for our Navy SEAL divers, uh, developing methods to prevent these seizures and uh, drugs did not work very well to prevent these types of seizures. And I stumbled upon the ketogenic diet and found that there were uh, peer reviewed publications and clinical trials to show that this was a highly efficacious diet. Two thirds of people who are completely drug refractory to anti-epileptic drugs respond to the ketogenic diet. Uh, a third of those have over 90% seizure control and 10 to 15% of those are what we call super responders. So these are individuals, patients that have rapid, total, and permanent seizure control. It's, it's demonstrating that the ketogenic diet is changing perhaps something in the brain that's uh, curing their epilepsy. So in the case of Charlie Abrams, he was able to stop the diet after one or two years. And a book that I wanna to bring to everybody's attention, which uh, was originally written by Johns Hopkins, which you know, is an institute that is spearheading the clinical use of the ketogenic diet for decades now. Uh, the late John Freeman mentored Dr. Eric Kossoff, who's a friend and colleague of mine. And he put, puts out this book, Ketogenic Diet Therapies, for epilepsy and other conditions. It used to be termed the ketogenic diet for pediatric epilepsy, but the applications are expanding. Before we talk about the, the mechanism of the ketogenic diet for producing the anti-seizure effect, I like to approach it from the context of uh, fasting ketosis or <laughs> uh, surviving starvation. And some interesting studies were done at Harvard Medical School in 1967. They were published by uh, Professor George Cahill and uh, Dr. Oliver Owens, who both passed away just a few years ago, but I did have the pleasure to talk with uh, Dr. George Cahill. So they fasted subjects in a study that was done at Harvard for 40 days. So th these types of research uh, experiments cannot be done today. I don't think any institutional review board would uh, approve these studies, but they fasted subjects for 40 days. And you can see from the graph here on the left that glucose goes down, but they don't necessarily uh, become hypoglycemic because there's very powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain blood glucose levels. But what happens is that we liberate fat for energy from our fat deposits, and this fat can fuel our bodies, but it cannot necessarily provide energy to the brain because these fatty acids do not cross the blood brain barrier. So the liver converts these fatty acids into ketone molecules, and the ketones are elevated after about seven days, uh, and they largely replace glucose as an energy source in the brain. And they also Ketone bodies have an anti-catabolic effect and they prevent the breakdown of skeletal muscle, gluconeogenic amino acids. They prevent the breakdown of this muscle tissue uh, by sparing uh, protein. And in, ex in an extension of the study that I found in a textbook, uh, Dr. Owen and Dr. Cahill injected insulin into the subjects that were fasted, uh, experiencing prolonged fasting. And the injection of insulin actually suppressed blood glucose down to one millimolar, which is universally fatal. It would typically produce a coma and seizures. And in these experiments, they demonstrated in a rather uh, dramatic fashion that uh, the ketones could largely replace glucose as an energy source, and it made the brain of these individuals extremely resilient to hypoglycemia. And this has practical consequences in the context of exercise, in the context of uh, losing weight. 
to, uh, uh, to maintain a, a weight loss diet. So typically when we're trying to lose weight or even if we're exercising, a drop in blood glucose can dramatically decrease performance or increase cravings for food. And if our brain has a steady fuel flow of ketones, that would largely abolish or mitigate or significantly attenuate these cravings or decrements in performance. So, and he showed this uh, in a very nice display in a number of papers uh, that about two thirds of brain energy metabolism are derived from ketones in a fasted state. And that would also apply to a ketogenic diet. So there are a variety of methods and mechanisms associated with therapeutic ketosis. And there's the classical ketogenic diet that's 90% fat. There's more recently in 2008, the modified Atkins diet or the modified ketogenic diet, which is much more liberal in protein, which is probably a good thing, uh, can produce a state of ketosis also and be used for adult epilepsy. So this is the clinical diet for adult epilepsy. And there's also another diet called the medium chain triglyceride diet, which is very high in a type of fat, a medium chain triglyceride, that's an eight to 10 carbon length. And these fats are transported to the liver via the hepatic portal duct and not through chylomicrons. And they produce a large increase in fat oxidation in the liver, which contributes to the production of these ketone bodies. And typically with a ketogenic diet, you need to have a sustained suppression of the hormone insulin, a drop in glucose and uh, a moderate to high decrease in, in liver glycogen to drive hepatic ketogenesis, which is essentially elevated fat oxidation in the liver to produce these ketones. So there is a way that we can completely circumvent uh, the dietary restriction associated with achieving a state of therapeutic ketosis. That's with adding keto, ketone fat, which is, as I mentioned, medium chain triglycerides, and also uh, exogenous ketone esters and ketone salts. These uh, entered the market a few years ago, and there's 97 clinical trials right now with exogenous ketones. So the, the science of this is advancing. I'm not going to talk about it too much. But uh, in, in the world of epilepsy and ketogenic research, these exogenous ketones uh, will uh, interest a lot of scientists who are now using them for a wide variety of applications. It's important to acknowledge that ketones are a powerful, perhaps even superior energy source for the brain and the heart. So there's a lot of research in cardiovascular physiology looking at the brain and also uh, about 14 different Alzheimer's studies looking at uh, elevating ketones for uh, treating mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. So in addition to ketones as an energy source, we also know that ketones have powerful signaling effects and uh, it's beyond the scope of this particular uh, presentation to go into all the signaling effects, but the signaling effects are largely due to you know, an elevation of ketones, the higher the level of ketones, the more uh, robust the signaling properties. And not only the elevation of ketones, but if you have a simultaneous decrease in glucose, if you have an elevation of ketones to 3.3 millimolar and a decrease in your blood glucose to 3.3 millimolar, we call that a glucose ketone index of one. So if you achieve a glucose ketone index of one, where your glucose and ketones are the same concentration in the blood, your brain is deriving half of the energy from ketones and half of the energy from glucose. So we can never drop glucose to zero. Our brains will always be using glucose. And this physiological state is also associated with a dramatic reduction suppression of the hormone insulin. And the simultaneous lowering of insulin, uh, elevation of ketones and lowering of glucose really produces a very robust uh, ketone signaling properties. And this could also occur independent of a lowering of glucose and insulin, but it's my belief that, you know, for example, a drop in mTOR, an in increase in AMP kinase, uh, an increase in the epigenetic <laughs> effects of ketones, which we are studying now in the lab, it's a little too much science to get into, but hist uh, ketone bodies can impart epigenetic effects through uh, activating various histone deacetylase, 
uh, enzymes. And also there's a process that we're looking at called beta hydroxybutyrylation, where beta hydroxybutyrate itself uh, directly impacts uh, or modifies histones to increase gene expression of certain genes that we're very interested in, in the context of treating different neurological disorders. So when it comes to applications, I did an overview, a quick overview of the published work. And I, every year I keep having to expand these applications. On the left side, we have applications where there are strong, there's strong evidence that ketogenic diets can have a profound effect on weight loss and, and weight management. So uh, losing weight is generally fairly easy, but maintaining that weight loss is a little more difficult. And I think ketogenic diets tend to be superior. The, the evidence of that is being debated by different groups, uh, a little bit controversial subject, but, uh, but generally speaking, there seems to be a benefit to carbohydrate restricted diets uh, in, in, if we compare that to uh, fat, uh, low fat diets. So there's a variety of different uh, groups that are studying the ketogenic diets for type two diabetes, inborn errors of metabolism. This was sort of like the original application. Uh, many of these are associated with seizures, a, a variety of different neurological applications. And what's really interesting is the emerging applications of the ketogenic diet. When I started, uh, giving presentations on uh, the ketogenic diet, I would first say if you're a type one diabetic completely, you know, don't even consider a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet that it could be very dangerous. But over the years, I have changed my mind on that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, cancer, inflammation, uh, anti cachexic effects or muscle sparing effects. There's a, a wide variety of emerging applications of the ketogenic diet, and, and it's an exciting time to be a researcher in this field. Uh, not only the ketogenic diet, but also the, uh, the experiments uh, associated with exogenous ketones and the development of new exogenous ketone compounds that could mimic many aspects of the ketogenic diet. So uh, we do that all, as well. We have about 50% of our research is ketogenic diet, and we do the other 50%, I would say, is exogenous ketones and looking at the applications there. So yesterday, I did a full overhaul overview of clinicaltrials.gov research, which are clinical trials that are registered uh, with, uh, and this database. And there is, uh, this is basically doubled in the last five years or more, uh, for cancer, a variety of epilepsies and different seizure disorders. Um, and I want to emphasize that clinicaltrials.gov are registered, typically, uh, university-based research programs. And the, these applications are not proven yet. Uh, many, the, the ones in the, in the black here are, there's already existing PubMed uh, peer-reviewed publications on epilepsy, cancer, weight loss, Alzheimer's disease, and type 2 diabetes. But these are the additional clinical trials that are being done now to further advance the science and the application of ketogenic diets for these uh, disorders or, or conditions. And I want to emphasize that in, you know, 10 years ago, there was very little, if any, uh, trials. So there's an explosion of research being done now. And in the years coming, this research will be published on uh, PubMed as peer-reviewed studies. So there's going to be, um, you know, additional support that may or may not support the ketogenic diet for these applications. So what was really interesting to me, and I had not reviewed this website in the last year or two, the emerging applications of the ketogenic diet, which are controversial, including COVID-19, there are psychiatric disorders that include bipolar, anxiety, there's uh, one or two studies on anorexia using the ketogenic for the diet for that, and also type one diabetes, which is very interesting. And it's an application that would seems counterintuitive right? Because of diabetic ketoacidosis. When someone hears about ketosis, they often think about diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a fatal condition that will produce a coma and death if it's not mitigated with insulin and uh, fluids and electrolytes. 
So at the bottom here, I did find a CrossFit study. So, and here is a trial number. If you want to look it up, there's, there's a trial, there's a ketogenic diet study specifically on CrossFit. I found interesting. Uh, and also things like alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Uh, so there's studies looking at the ketogenic diet for addiction and dependence, which is very interesting. So I want to briefly talk about carbohydrate restriction, ketogenic diets for exercise, uh, especially in the context of type one diabetes. I just lectured on this topic at the American Diabetes Association, where it was a debate between another uh, well, uh, well published researcher who studies high carbohydrate diets for type one diabetes and exercise. I think it can be, and, and I don't know if there was a, uh, you know, if we won the debate or not, but it was a very good discussion. And some of the provocative questions that evolved out of it was, or some of the things that we know is that if you can keep your blood glucose between 80 and 120, that's considered normal glycemia. This is optimal for health and performance. We know that. So the provocative questions that we have, and this is not you know, only in the context of type one diabetes, although the discussion uh, presentation was that, but it could also apply to type two diabetes or the healthy athlete. Do very low carbohydrate diets offer an advantage? Uh, specifically in this context for type one diabetes, if you can, if it helps them maintain that glycemia, would this reduce insulin requirements for type one diabetes? So provocative question, a bit of a loaded question, because I think we do know that low carbohydrate ketogenic diets can drastically reduce uh, the requirements of insulin for type one di diabetes. And is the diet that reduces insulin requirements, is this superior for the management of type one diabetes? I think any endocrinologist who treats patients with type one diabetes will say that whenever you could use less insulin to achieve and maintain glycemia within an optimal range, that dietary approach would be superior. So it's kind of hard to argue with that. So again, it's, it's a bit of a loaded question uh, as the use of carbohydrate restricted diets are starting to permeate uh, the American Diabetes Association uh, discussion, uh, especially for, uh, it has for quite some time for type two diabetes, but not so much for type one. My uh, former PhD student, excellent student, presidential fellow is Dr. Andrew Kutnick. He has given a TEDx talk on this, on the use of low carbohydrate diets for type one diabetes. He's an athlete, he's a power lifter. Uh, he's uh, uh, very high achieving in academia. And I would, I would direct your attention to that presentation, his TEDx talk, and also his talk at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, which he's now employed there as a research scientist. And he co-authored an article with Dr. David Ludwig and Dr. Leonard's uh, colleagues from Harvard on the use of carbohydrate restriction for diabetes, rediscovering centuries old wisdom. I direct uh, your attention to that article, which is fantastic. So some of the questions that I want to leave you with is um, to consider for performance and health, or cr is chronic carbohydrate restriction needed to gain benefits? So this is a question we don't have an answer to yet, but we know that periodically going into a state of ketosis can be beneficial. And if the athlete is fat adapted or carb adapted, there could be some benefits in regard to performance, but also recovery. Dr. Jeff Volek is studying that pretty intensely now. Uh, are the benefits dependent upon the exercise modality? I think we have pretty good evidence with endurance athletes. Uh, the big question is for CrossFit athletes and for uh, weightlifters. So my interpretation of the data is that for body composition alterations, and if someone needs to lose weight to make a specific weight category, a low carb diet or ketogenic diet could be superior in regards to losing weight and maintaining uh, muscle and strength with a weight loss. Are there gender differences? So this is a huge question and we're approaching it from a variety of different perspectives now from the clinical perspective and also from the performance perspective and hopefully we'll have some, some data on that. And do, ele do elevated ketones provide a unique advantage? A, a low carb diet does not have to be ketogenic to the point where it's lowering ketones to produce uh, sustained ketonemia. So this is a question, an ongoing question. Uh, and is the diet that optimizes performance in the gym, is that diet optimal for health and longevity? 
Uh, and another question I want to leave you with, is a diet that optimizes glycemic variability, and we know this is the case for type 2 diabetics, is that diet optimal for long-term health? I would say that a diet that optimizes and maintains lower glycemic variability, which means lower postprandial spikes in glucose and insulin, we know very good data in type 2 diabetes. It has not been studied in normal, healthy people. We're, we have a clinical trial right now looking at this. Uh, in normal, healthy people who follow a low-carb diet, we look at other biomarkers that would correlate to long-term health. Um, we don't know the, the answer to that question, but we are actively studying that now. It's a provocative question. And I want to leave you with uh, some of the references that were uh, helped me put together this title and also a number of books that have been very informative, including the book from Johns Hopkins, Ketogenic Diet and Metabolic Therapies, Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson is great. My colleague and uh, friend, Dr. Mary Newport, wrote the book, uh, The Complete Book of Ketones. And my colleague and very good friend, Dr. Thomas Seyfried, wrote a book on cancer as a metabolic disease. I'd like to draw your attention to that book if you're interested in that, the use of ketogenic diets for cancer. Uh, and I'd like to finish off with just directing you to, if you have further um, questions or, or you're interested in these topics, uh, you can check my website out, educational website, ketonutrition.org. Thank you for your attention.